So I was playing ESO a couple of weeks ago because this DLC came out, and it actually came out probably a couple of months ago. Um, I think it was like December or November of last year, but it's the Orsinium DLC. And I wanted to play it because I've always been fascinated with orcs and their culture, and of course, um, we haven't actually seen Orsinium. Now, that's a lie. I think we saw it back in um, Arena or Daggerfall, one of those. I still haven't played any of those two, so to me, they're kind of interchangeable uh, for now, which might be an insult to some people, but I really gotta get in on that. Anyways, um, you, you do get to see it in one of the games, it's just this kind of pixelated city. But I wanted to see it in, 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 in a more kind of modern um, way, in, in a newer game, so to speak. I wanted to see how... Not just, I mean, Bethesda or Sandy Max, I just wanted to see how they represented it, because it's, I mean, you know, it's one of those cities, I want to see it, it's cool. And I did, and it's fantastic, and I'll see about putting a couple of pictures in here, or just a straight up video, I'll see what I do, but... Um, I was, I was fascinated by it, and I walked through it a little bit, and I started doing some, some quests. And, and, and this is one of my issues, um, with ESO, is that... I'm, I'm never sure whether everything that happens in this game is canon or not. Now, look, I'm pretty sure that most of the main plot points are most probably canon. I mean, it would be so weird if we were to play, you know, Elder Scrolls 7 Alinor or something, right? And then just be like, a character just go out and say, Oh, yeah, Molag Bol has never invaded Astaroth. Astaroth? Wow. That's never invaded Tamriel. <laughs> Got my games confused. Um, it would be weird, right? Like, I understand that these games are made by different companies, but there has to be a level of continuity between these two. There just has to be, because otherwise it would just be weird. Now, I would imagine that to be the case with the main plot points, right? Molag Ball invading um, the city of... Or Simar, you know, if it gets if it gets destroyed by a meteor in the in the ESO, like I would imagine that would be canon, right? Like the main big things. However, there's a lot of very specific nuances and and small quest lines that are actually kind of impactful in their own little ways, especially as far as the lore of the game is concerned. And I don't know if those are canon or not. And let me give you guys an example, right? This is something that actually had me giddy for a very long time, and I was really excited about even talking about it, but I wasn't sure if if I should or not. Um, the quest involves the rich men versus the orcs, because you see there's a bunch of uh, those kind of rich men from, from Skyrim, from the Reach, um, living in this mountainous regions of the Rothgarian Mountains in, in High Rock. And they're, they are at war essentially with the orcs, because the orcs are now kind of taking over this particular region. And as you all know, the rich men are uh, very much so aligned with the hags, with the hag ravens, and uh, the hag ravens and their crazy witchery paganistic magic involves the Briarhearts. Now, in the quest line, it is shown to us that the Briarhearts are actually fruits, not seeds, but they are fruits that grow from a tree that grows from humanoid corpses. Yeah, so what you do is you grab the seed version of the briar hearts and then you plant them into. Uh, see, it, it's not told. I don't remember if it was told to us uh, whether or not it was. It had to be a human corpse or an orc corpse or an, an elf or anything. It's just it was just a human or corpse, right? And you were to plant the seed in it, and then the tree would grow from the body, using the body as some form of nutrient or fertilizer. And then from this monstrosity kind of, um, I guess, living uh, amorphous tree or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, it looked kind of like a messed up tree with like kind of flesh growing from it, right? Uh, then the bright heart would kind of bloom from that. And then you could use the bright heart. It would have power and, you know, you know the story of how to use bright hearts. I just made a video about hag ravens. Um, but so that's the deal. I'm not sure if that's canon. I don't know, you know, very easily we could see the next Elder Scroll game, uh, the single player just be like, oh no, that's, this is actually how you make Briar Hearts. And if I were to have used the ESO content as canon, like I would have been pretty much just lying to myself the whole time and lying to you guys as well. So it kind of, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to use that information, but it definitely had me uh, 
giddy a little bit because it's really fucking cool. Like, that's awesome. A tree that actually grows from human corpse corpses. It it's very much uh, Dragon Age in that aspect. It's kind of macabre and just fucked up, but it's awesome, <laughs> which I, I, I love that sort of shit. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty fucking dark. But it, uh, it kind of made me very curious about Oryx. And, and, and just, uh, I just want to talk about them a little bit because they're cool and, and they're kind of in my mind at the moment. So, uh, the questions are, you know, wh what are the orcs? Where do they come from? What have I, what have they been doing? And, and what's up with Orsinium? You know, where is it exactly? What is it doing? Do people hate Orsinium? You know, does it have good relationships with, you know, the people of High Rock, right? We're gonna try and answer some of those questions, but just generally just talk about them because I want to talk about them. So, first of all, where do the orcs come from? And this is the thing that it's 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 a really cool story, and I've probably told this story um, a couple of in a couple of different ways in probably short summaries um, and little pieces of it too in different videos. But let's just go all out on this one because I think it deserves it. So first of all, we know that. Uh, all of the elves in the world of Tamriel come from one place, right? We know uh, that the Dark Elves, that the Snow Elves, uh, we know that <coughs> the Falmer, which I guess are Snow Elves, uh, they, they all come from originally uh, the Somerset Isles, or that particular region of Balanwood, and you know, the, uh, I guess you could even say um, their Lost Island. Uh, they all come from essentially the old region and what they used to be called before was the old Elnofe, which is like the oldest of the oldest of the oldest of the generations of elves. They are essentially, as far as the elves believe, because we know that the Nords believe that, you know, Kinareth breath life into the world and that's how the animals and that's how the Spriggans and that's how the Nords were created. They have, their, everyone has their own belief systems, but the elves specifically believe that they come directly as descendants of the, the, of the Adras who created the planet. Um, so the first, the very first kind of like incarnation of the Adras were the old Elnofe. And then from there, everyone else came from, right? You have the old Elnofe and you have the normal Elnofe. The normal Elnofe are like the humans and they pretty much just essentially de-evolved into like a primitive version of the elves, which eventually became, you know, the humans and the Red Guards and everyone else. Um, but essentially everyone comes from the same pot, right? So imagine thousands of years ago you had this very powerful and very massive kind of group of elves and uh, and you know very prosperous and very magically powerful so magically powerful in fact that you know they became decadent they became uh, that when you imagine like really magical and powerful elves you imagine this sort of group of people who enchant brooms for the brooms to literally clean dust by themselves so that the elves don't have to move a, a finger. You know, like elves that would create um, artifacts and magical arcane golems to do their work for them, right? Like they're abusing magic to the vast extent of their capabilities. Well, there was this group of people who essentially got frustrated at that. They thought, hey, we're becoming way too decadent. We need to go back to traditions. We need to like do shit for ourselves. And in fact, out of that entire group of people, of elves that thought that, there was a very specific and interesting Daedra who also thought that. This Daedra was Boethia. So what essentially, uh, it because it's not really a he or a she the daedras don't have a concept of gender but it's for some reason i keep thinking it's a she so i'm gonna just say she for the purposes of this video um boethia she actually she knew that um even though there was a lot of elves that kind of believed in what she believed she's just a daedra and just you have to understand that elves have a different way of looking at daedras um they don't see them as and they don't see them as evil, as, you know, humans or the Empire does, but they also don't necessarily see them as, you know, someone that you need to either, you know, believe in or or you're gonna get smitten, right? Like, it's, it's I think it's more of a, I don't know, more, more of an equal sort of thing, although they definitely do uh, believe, uh, you know, kind of in a Daedic way with a lot of other Daedras. We know that they venerate uh, Ogma and... Uh, a lot of actual just normal elves, like not even like gods, just straight up people that have grown powerful enough to be venerated. But um, 
what Boethia did is she transformed herself into one of the best champions of the elvish kind of society that they had. Imagine this champion, this is the guy who single-handedly defeated Lorcan. Like, this guy is a beast, right? She transformed herself into this person, so to form an army of elves to essentially just leave, to migrate into another province to form their own uh, country, essentially, and then so that they can just kind of do whatever they want to do. And she did, she transformed herself into this champion and she formed this massive army and left. Now, thing is, the actual champion, the real one, not the impersonator, but the real one, realized that this was happening, so he himself formed his own army to battle the imposter. Now, this champion is Trinimac. When he confronted Boethia, Boethia defeated Trinimac and legends, and this is like orc culture and, uh, and elvish kind of myths, but it is said that Boethia literally ate <laughs> Trinimac and then from the dung, from the poop, that came out of that consumption came Malekith, which is now essentially... I mean, you know Malekith as the Daedric Lord of the Orcs. Um, but what ended up happening is that that consumption, that poop or whatever... I don't even know. See, that's what the book says. That's, that's what the stories say, that she literally just pooped him out. I don't know if that's true. I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, right? But that's just what it says. <laughs> um, but this transformation literally deformed Trinimac and essentially made him into an orc, an orc god. And, and this transformation also happened to uh, his entire following, the, the, those that were fighting against Boethia. Now, there were a lot of the army there that kind of went with Boethia and remained loyal to her, even though they realized that she had essentially impersonated their biggest champion. Some of them, a lot of them, still maintained their ground and, and kept loyal to Boethia although some of them did not, and those that did not, and everyone else who followed Trinimac got also transformed into the orcs. So that's essentially the, the kind of inception of this particular race. And I mean, we know that Boethia continued down her path into Morrowind, and she formed what is now Morrowind and the Dark Elves, although back then they were still not the Dark Elves. The transformation from those elves into their dark sort of version happened a lot later. But the orcs, I mean, they couldn't stay in Valenwood, they couldn't stay in Somerset Isles. Uh, they had been deformed, they, they looked like shit, they looked like orcs. So they uh, they had to leave and, you know, we know that they kind of moved north into more of what is now High Rock and the Vrthgaran Mountains and they just kind of settled there. But that, but that is essentially the story of where they come from. And this is, this is very important because... Um, this is something that is going to most definitely happen the next time we deal with orcs. And I want you guys to know this history because the next time we meet with the orcs, if we ever go to Orsinium, or if you were to play ESO um, and, 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 and kind of check out the, the religious aspect of what's going on over there, it's really important because um, the orcs believe in Malekith. They believe that this actually happened, that Trinimac no longer exists, and now Malekith is the guy that you're supposed to venerate. The problem is, a lot of the latest rulers, the, the, the latest orc chieftains of the orcs, actually believe in the opposite. They believe that Trinimac is still very much alive and that Malekith is just this random other entity that just took the place of Trinimac in order to steal his uh, his populace. So um, there is this kind of a, kind of a conflict, this religious battle that's been going on currently in Orsinium, at least has been happening for the past couple of centuries, where there's this very strong religious movement that is just kind of nope, Malakath is, is just a fake dude, and it, it's definitely causing a lot of struggle, which I find to be fascinating. Um, <laughs> that you don't even know who your god is, especially in a world where um, I mean, there there is such a thing as the summoning of of Malekith, it's the, um, I don't remember when it is, it's like the 8th or the 9th of Frostfall, is it? I, I, I think it's like the 9th of September or some shit, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> but like, there is such a thing as Malekith coming out and actually talking to, you know, a group of people. Uh, so, I mean, we have encountered Malekith in, in, in the games even, so it's just interesting to me. 
Uh, but it's really cool. I find that really cool. Now let's talk about Orsinium because Orsinium is one of those cities that um, the capital of the orcs has always been Orsinium. Like that, that's just that's just what it is. If you make a place where all the orcs congregate, it is called Orsinium, even though there are more than just one capital, one city of orcs. I mean, the Rothgarin Mountains, uh, better known as Rothgar. Um, is it's pretty wide. I mean, if you look at any map, you will see that it's kind of fucking massive. Uh, it's just that for some reason, um, n nobody likes a, a congregation of orcs. Whenever that happens, uh, especially High Rock and, and, and Daggerfall and Wayrest, which are, um, well, Daggerfall is a little bit farther from Rothgarin Mountains, but uh, Wayrest is pretty close. And uh, they tend to not like any congregations of orcs, especially because the very first one, like the, the very first time that Orsinium was created, um, it was kind of fucked up. I mean, you have to understand, this wasn't just orcs. This was a congregation of orcs and goblins, um, which is very interesting because we have never talked about goblins being together with orcs in the Elder Scrolls world, probably since the first... Uh, the first uh, age, I, and I'm I'm trying I'm struggling here, and you guys can help me on this. That's true, right? Like I don't think we have really seen orcs and goblins together in the Elder Scrolls. I mean, this is obviously something that happens a lot in other um, in, in other show. I mean, in in um, Lord of the Rings, right? And and uh, it's it's a common thing, goblins and orcs, in, in Dungeons and Dragons. That's another thing, and it's 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 something that happens a lot in Elder Scrolls. It's just really not a thing, which is very interesting. Um, but we have we have definitely figured out that the goblins believe in the same uh, god that orcs do, which I, I, they actually have a different name for it. Um, we know that it is Malekith, but it is also called Moloch or Maulok, which is. Um, it's supposed to just be like a different, I guess, name for the uh, for Malakath, and that's specifically the name that the goblins use uh, for their god. So it is kind of, it's not understood as much as it is um, believed that uh, they believe in the same god. Now, do keep in mind that this this book that I'm referring to, which I can't think of the name right now, but this book that it where it is said that the goblins believe in the same god that the orcs do is actually a book found in ESO, so take that with a grain of salt. It's not Oblivion or Skyrim where you find this book. Um, so if you want to believe in that, then, you know, you, you can do that. Uh, I think it's really cool anyways. But yeah, this first Orsinium that was built was essentially like what you would find in, in Tolkien literature, like this this messed up kind of lawless, and that at least that's what the Bretons say. The Bretons say that it was this messed up kind of city of, of lawlessness and and uh, and war, whereas the actual orcs back then say that it was it was a uh, a city of agriculture and and poetry and niceness, right? So there is this economy of people saying different things, which is the Elder Scrolls way, by the way. It's fucking everyone says their own thing, and it's hard to discern which one is true or not. Uh, point is, that city was destroyed. The orcs allegedly started like um, invading some of the lands that surrounded Roth Guardian Mountains, and uh, the Bretons just didn't want any of that shit, so they just assaulted and literally destroyed. They didn't just destroy the city; they decimated everyone inside. It was a literal like genocide what happened in there at least that's how it is told so much so in fact that no record of uh any of the books any of the literature anything that had to do or that was inside of orsinium was completely destroyed like those guys came in and they're angry um and then there was the 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 second construction of orsinium which happened i don't know how many years after i, I should have probably looked that up but uh that, that's the, this is the one that you find in ESO. It, that, that's, that would be the second construction of Orsinium. Um, eventually, however, it was destroyed. And then there was a third one, which is um, the one that if you were to uh, if you were to play Oblivion and you were to find the book, um, I think it's called the Pocket, uh, the Empire's Pocket. Uh, fuck, what's the name of it again? Uh, the Pocket Guide to the Empire, I think is what's what's called. It pretty much essentially tells you the story of every land, right? And if you were to read about what it says about Orsinium, this is what it talks about, the third kind of biggest city. And this one was really cool because it is said that the Orc Shifton that ruled the third iteration of Orsinium was like really politically savvy and very diplomatic in nature. So he was the one that uh, actually... Um, really attempted to bring peace into the orcs and make sure that they were part of the empire because you have to understand like imagine the goblins in Cyrodiil like they're not part of the empire they're not even considered citizens of the empire they're just there and, and sure they have cities 
in Cyrodiil, probably underground, but they, they're, they're there. But they're not recognized by the Empire, so... The, imp the Emperor could easily just be like, hey, yeah, just kill them. And, I mean, no one would blink an eye because they're not actual citizens of the Empire. And that's what the Orc chieftain from the Third Orsinium essentially tried to do. Like, hey, we're here. We want to, I don't you know, pay, pay, we want to pay your taxes. We're going to fight your wars. We want to be legit. Just give us our province. Give us our citizenship. And we want to be cool. And, um... Whether that happened or not, it's not actually told to us. We were told that the application uh, was sent, but it doesn't actually tell us whether it happened or not. So that's interesting. At least to me, it is. Because imagine, imagine the uh, you know, the Argonians uh, how they're treated in Windhelm. Imagine the uh, the Kaji caravans like not being allowed entry in the cities, uh, in, in any main city. And okay, you know, granted there are reasons for that. I mean, we know that the Nords are generally very racist. And we also know that the Khajiit caravans steal and sell contraband. Um, so there are reasons for that. But imagine, I mean, that's how the orcs for the most part are treated, you know? Um, it wasn't until, you know, probably the second iteration of Orsinium or even the third where they were actually granted citizenship like when if you go if you're playing oblivion and you go into the city and you look at the at the guards i mean it, it is not unlikely for you to see an orc guard or an orc vendor you know but back then that was fucking crazy you can't just go into a town and see an orc like, that's what that doesn't happen um and it was until those two kind of moments that when those cities were really built and that the whole diplomacy thing happened for them that you know, that kind of became a reality which is really cool for me um, but now, before we end this video, um, I, and, and one of the biggest things, I wanted to bring the point to this specific moment because uh, I think this is by far the most interesting thing about the orcs right now and that I want to talk about in this video, which is... We're not sure where Orsinium is anymore. <laughs> I, I know that it might sound crazy, but legitimately, and... and, and some of you guys can help me uh, this help me with this or dispro disprove me or whatever, but um, there is this one particular uh, loading screen t tip. Uh, you, you know, in Skyrim, when you're when you enter a cave or whatever, there's a loading screen, and in the loading screen, um, there's usually a rotating picture, blah blah blah. But there's also this little kind of tool tip on the bottom. It's probably one or two lines of dialogue that essentially just gives you. Uh, a little bit of lore or, or help or a guide or something. It just tells you something, right? I mean, we, we all know what I'm talking about here. Um, one of those loading screen texts says that Orsinium is located between Skyrim and Hammerfall in the mountains, right? You know the mountains um, where they mine silver in the reach. Like, that's the mountain they're talking about. I mean, that's the only mountain between Hammerfell and Skyrim that I know of. Which is interesting because the Ruthgarren Mountains are nowhere near that. The, the Ruthgarren Mountains are way to the west. I mean, they are literally inside of um, High Rock. It's, I mean, we know for a fact that Orsinium uh, is in between Wayrest and uh, Daggerfall. I mean, every map will tell you that. But now, the tooltips here say that it is in between Skyrim and Hammerfell in the mountains of the Reach. That, uh... I don't know if it's just a tooltip, or maybe I'm just misunderstand misunderstanding something here. Maybe I just have it wrong, but it's weird. Uh, I mean, you can look it up if you want to. It literally says that, so... That's... that's I don't know. That's I, I just I don't even have an answer for that. I really don't. It's 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 interesting because I mean we know that um, there's a lot of orc settlements in Skyrim by the Reach. I mean that's I would that's where most of the orc settlements are, right? In the uh, you know in the mountains of the south of Skyrim and uh, to the uh, west of Skyrim, all all over the Reach, in the in the mountains, you'll find a lot of settlements for orc tribes in there. So, um, which makes sense since it's closer to the orc empire. But I just I just find it fascinating that. Uh, the city could literally just be there. I mean, it would have been very easy for uh, for Skyrim, for Bethesda to just be like, oh no, we actually, before we release the next uh, the next game, uh, there's a new DLC, uh, Orsinium. It's right there in the mountains of Skyrim. I mean, that could have literally happened, which might have been the reason why they did it in the first place. You know, think think back maybe seven years, they're like, oh, all right, we're creating Skyrim. Um, we're still not sure what DLC we're gonna have. 
Uh, but just 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 move Orsinium over to Skyrim just in case we want to use it as a DLC. Maybe that's what happened. Um, we'll see if they take that back and if they keep Orsinium back in the Vrathgarren Mountains. But I just I just find that very interesting, and I hope that you do too. Hope you all enjoyed the video, even though, again, as most of my videos, uh, they are a little bit rambly, but I enjoy it that way. See you all next time.